Well, we're going to finish off the week with Chapter 3. We're going to talk about density curves. We're going to define what a density curve is, give the properties of a density curve, describe different density curves, and then we're going to talk about one very special one, the one that you're seeing right here, the normal curve. For, um, and then we're going to talk about the standard normal distribution, finding normal proportions, and using the standard normal table, and finding a value given a proportion using this table and the distribution that we're in. Well, when you've got a sample and you want to have an idea or try to guess or estimate, approximate, or have a good idea of what the parent distribution it came from, the best thing to do is you plot your data. Make some type of graph. And we've done histograms, stem plots. We've done box plots. We've done, I, I showed you a dot plot. We'll do things called a normal probability plot. All these things help us to um, determine or at least have a good idea of what our parent distribution just might be. We look for patterns in our data. We Remember we had learned how to calculate numerical summaries of our data for center and spread. And sometimes the overall pattern of a large number of observations is so regular that we can describe it by a smooth curve. That's what we call modeling. So here's an example of what I'm talking about. This is a graph. It's a histogram of vocabulary, vocabulary scores of 947 seventh graders. So the histogram um, is the orange rectangles that you see, of course. Now the smooth cu curve that's drawn over that histogram is a mathematical model for the distribution. As you can see, it's not a perfect fit. It's not perfect but it's an awful good fit. And what we want to do is we want to be able to model our data um, with these mathematical models. And if we can get a model for it that we know a lot about, it helps us in doing inferential statistics. Now, the models that we're going to be most concerned with are um, to have to do with statistics are density curves. And they're defined by probability density functions. Now, we're not going to get heavy into what a function is, but the vocabulary is important. Now, quickly, a function, if we can have a function, we'll be able to compute areas under a curve. Now, you won't be required to actually do calculus. And in fact, um, we'll have tables that you'll use that will help us to find these areas. In this chapter, we'll call them proportions. You'll later hear them being called probabilities. So there's different ways to look at areas under a curve. So you're looking at a density curve right now. And this density curve is what we call the normal curve. And it's got many, many nice, nice characteristics. And we'll learn about that in just a little while. Now, that function that you see right here has to have two um, very important properties if we call it a probability density function. The density curves are defined by these probability density functions. It's a formula used to specify and compute areas under the curve. This is going to give us either the areas, and these areas are probabilities or proportions for random variables. Now, we haven't gotten into probabilities yet, but you'll soon hear them called probabilities. In this chapter, they're called proportions. The function now, as I said, the function must have two properties. The total area under the graph of the function is equal to 1. That is, the total probability is 1. And again, we'll learn about that. And the function is always greater than or equal to 0. Now, here's a very easy example. This function right here, this straight line, this horizontal line, which makes the uniform distribution, it is above the x-axis, making it greater than 0. So it, it, um, it fulfills that the function is always greater than or equal to 0. And also that the total area under the graph is equal to 1. Well, what's the area of a rectangle? Well, it's the length times the width. And if I do length, which is 10, times the width, which is 0.1, that equals 1. So this a particular um, function does 
satisfy the two properties of a um, probability density function. So this is just an example. Now we need the fact that underneath the area underneath that complete curve has to equal 1 in order to say that it is a probability density function. So to reiterate, the total area under the graph of the function is equal to 1. Again, it's, it's the same thing as saying the total probability is 1. That will let us determine the probabilities or proportions of a continuous random variable. Um, and we can find out the probabilities between two values, two numbers. And the function always has to be greater than or equal to 0, ensures that we have something called a probability distribution, which again will be studied later. Now looking at this example, we have this uniform distribution. If I ask you what proportion of our data is less than 5, what would you tell me? Half of it. It's pretty very, very easy to see here. But this is what we're talking about. So, I mean, you can find out proportions of our data between different x values or different variable values. Now, in a little more complicated uh, model, let's look at this example. If I took my actual sample and I said, what's the proportion of scores that are less than 6? We could literally um, take the areas of each of these um, rectangles and add them up. It ends up that that proportion equals 0 0.303. Now, let's look at our approximation if we use this curve, this density curve, on the next slide. If we look at the area underneath this curve, it ends up being 0.293, a pretty good estimate. So we're going to use the density curve to approximate the proportion or the area or the probability either between different data values, less than a certain data value, or greater than a certain data value. Now here's a likelihood interpretation. An interpretation of the probability density function is that the random variable is more likely to be in the regions where the function is higher, like in the center part that you see right here, it's the highest point. The random variable is less likely to be in those regions where the function is lower. The median is of a density curve is that place where if I draw a line, there's equal areas to the right of it and to the left. It's that point that divides the area under the curve in half. Whereas the mean is that balance point. So if the curve was sal solid, we'd have a ful fulcrum and we'd lay it on top of there and it would balance. We'd find that center of gravity. Now, if our density curve is symmetric, the mean and median will be the same. However, if our data is skewed, we already know what would happen. If we have a left-tailed distribution, our mean will be less than the median. And if we have a right-tailed distribution, our mean will be greater than. And we saw that in that chart that we did in the last chapter, this one right here. Now, density curves are idealized descriptions of data. So we need to distinguish between the mean and standard deviation of a density curve and the mean and standard deviation computed from our actual observations. The mean and standard deviation of the idealized distribution of the data is represented by mu. That, that strange looking little u looking thing is called mu. And sigma, the fancy looking o, is called sigma. The mean and standard deviation computed from the actual observation of the data is x bar. That's the mean. And the standard deviation is s. Now, for most density curves, we can I, we can roughly locate the, the mean of the density curve, but the sigma is a little bit more difficult. However, with the normal curve, the cur curve that we're going to be um, studying in this chapter, we can locate sigma by I. Well, first, let's look at the normal curve and its shape. It's called the bell-shaped curve. This is the fundamental distribution underlying most of inferential statistics for continuous distributions. 